Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction, which was far too kind and has stolen five minutes of what I could have used for my own presentation. So I always sit there thinking, ooh, I'd rather just talk to you about this. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to just talk about the definitions of war, but in fact, as I'm a chair in international relations, I was going to start with international relations, even though I know very well that many of you have, have the, the great um, advantage of not being hemmed in by current trends in international relations by being in departments other than international relations departments. But still, I think definitions are incredibly important. What's in a word? What's in a name? In Scotland, there is a degree program which is called natural philosophy. Elsewhere, this refers to physics. Does it matter what we call it? As the bard said, a rose by any other name smells sweet, and physics differs not from natural philosophy. For centuries, as I hope I have to have shown with this book, Strategy Before Clausewitz, people made strategic decisions about war and peace, and yet the West had no word for this, but used others, including tactics, system, or none at all. So yes, you can have stratégie avant la lettre, um, and again, the label doesn't matter much. Sometimes, however, the label does matter a lot. And this is the structure of what I'm going to be talking to you about. So you can say, you know, so many more minutes for the coffee break. Um, um, a label can matter a lot because it can make you blind to things that you should see by simply somehow cutting them out because of the way you define your label. We in our common area of research have been lumbered with the term international relations. The very term is fundamentally flawed, as I hope to argue, as already my teacher, the late Donald Cameron Watt, noted. This term actually obstructs a better understanding of our subject area, as I shall explain. The term, as you probably know, was borrowed from law and is usually attributed to Jeremy Bentham that he's supposed to have coined the term international law for the first time around the very beginning of the 19th century. But international, what does this actually imply? Nation has meant many things over time, and it's very important to dwell on the term nation, because the term pervades our discipline, for better and worse, worse in my opinion. Its original Latin meaning, natio, apparently initially had a derogatory sense for those people not born in the Roman Empire, born outside it. By the high Middle Ages, the term took on many different meanings. So, for example, at the Sorbonne in Paris, there were four nations of students. Those were the Honourable Nation of France, which meant also the Italians and the Spanish, the Loyal Nation of Picardy, which included the Dutch, the Venerable Nation of Normandy, and the Constant Nation of Germania, which included the English. Meanwhile, in church councils, the word Nazio meant a faction, a party. In Brussels in the late Middle Ages and early modern times, the na a a nations were the civic units, a bit like the contade in Italy, uh, that elected representatives to the city government. So they were quarters of the town and their people. When in the 17th century, Cardinal Mazarin uh, founded the building, had the building built that is now the Institut de France, it was called the Collège des Quatre Nations, and the Quatre Nations were the new nations that had been integrated into France, Flanders, Alsace, bit of the Piedmont, and Roussillon. Elsewhere in the 16th and 18th century, nation, nation referred only to the lords, i.e. the aristocracy and the bishops of a kingdom or empire, explicitly not the common people. It is only with the American Revolution and War of Independence and the French Revolution, and in general usage since, that nation has been defined as the entire population of a state rather than a tribe or an ethnic group with or without its state, or a population fighting for the right to have its own state. So the term international law made some sense in Bentham's time if you thought about it in terms of the entire American nation now wanting to engage with other, uh, other states or the in entire uh, nation of France having, uh, conducting its foreign policy or having relations. The word has a real shortcoming, though, because it conjures up the notion that it concerns relations between nations. In fact, normally it doesn't. It normally is limited to relations between governments of states. And really, it should be called interstate law. The term state, of course, has its own problems. It is derived from Latin status, meaning a meaning that we still encounter in the expression of the state of affairs or the US president's annual state of the nation speech. In the Middle Ages, it came to denote the estates, a class system, and then by the 17th century, in the constant text of the Netherlands, the components of the Dutch Republic, the Estates General. 
From there, it spread to denote state in our modern sense, in many ways the modern equivalent of the res publica, especially when it comes to state-owned, i.e. public institutions such as schools, libraries, public records office. For these, English has no adjective other than public, or indeed national, when in German you would use the word staatlich, or in Russian, gosudarstveni, of the state, belonging to the state. Moreover, American political scientists use the, term, use the term national as a synonym for federal, to differentiate the level of Washington DC's policies or legislation from those of the state of Texas. They will refer to the USA as a nation state to make the distinction, but as we shall see, the term rarely fits a European context. A regular tax revenue, a judiciary and a penitentiary system. To allude to Max Weber's definition of the state, a state would surely have and not just effectively claim a monopoly of the use of force, as some medieval monarchs did progressively. Therefore, ignoring the city-states of ancient times and some parts of Europe and the Middle Ages, Italy, Flanders, the cities of the Han Hansa, and several empires of antiquity with their fairly large and effective bureaucratic apparatuses, many scholars insist that there were no proper states before modern times. So a study of interstate relations, by their definition, narrowly defined, would have to leave out most of antiquity, uh, a thousand years of the Middle Ages, a period of diplomacy, treaties, wars, trade, and above all, politics. But all these entities had relations worth studying. To stress the structured policy making of these entities, one should perhaps use the word Greek, the Greek Greek word polity, and talk about interpolity relations rather than international relations. But I shall argue later that we should not just study the relations between governments in the first place. I can see the question arising in your minds why we on earth we should make an effort to include medieval states, let alone antiquity, in our study of international relations. Indeed. Our good friend Clausewitz thought that the nearer one came to his own times, the more history was worth studying. Frankly, I think he dismissed the other periods because he didn't know Greek and Latin. In any case, I disagree profoundly with him for two reasons. First, the more numerous and the more diverse are the different patterns of interpolity relations we bring to our studies, the less we shall blinker ourselves to possible changes of the future which may indeed be fundamental changes away from the assumptions that underlay much of IR theory as it came into being in the 20th century. Assumptions as those that we find in the Montevideo Convention. Secondly, as Martin van Creefeld and others have pointed out, history is not a linear development. Medieval social patterns such as warlordism or large-scale social networks across state boundaries and even pre-modern forms of war are making their reappearance to exist alongside more modern patterns. Now let me tackle the term national as an international transnational. So we've constituted, we've established that national is used by Americans as a synonym for the federal state. And of course the link was established by the fact that the USA, the nation, is sovereign and this is also of course constitutionally the case in France. There is a nation is the sovereign. In a European context where the nation is defined as sovereign, in those states where the nation is defined as sovereign, along the precedent set by the American and French revolutions or by Switzerland, it does make sense to speak about the nation state in this civic sense. But of course, in more than a third of the states of Europe, it is not the nation that is formally speaking the sovereign, but it is a monarch. Constitutionally spoken, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Spain, the Netherlands and Belgians are thus not nation states. There is a very important alternative sense in which the term national is used, and that of course in Europe is much more widespread. The pedigree of this goes back to the antithesis to the French Revolution and that all of it is brought us. As many specialists on the history of nationalism have underscored, the German-led reaction to the term national in the American, French, civic, republican, political sense was guided by the ideal of a state that should encompass all those belonging to an ethnically defined nation. And that ethnic definition was originally first and foremost one of language and culture. If this definition is applied, then the creation of nation-states was, and to some extent still is an ideal, 
but in Europe it tended to go along with war and repression, up to and including the elimination of all those who did not fit the description through ethnic cleansing, expulsion or even genocide. From culture and ethnicity, which can be acquired, to racism, which is a lottery you have entered in with birth, it is a slippery slope. Hitler was the most consequent in the pursuit of the creation of a racially pure nation state, as he aimed at bringing all Germans into one state. The Holocaust and the umpty millions who died in Europe in the Second World War were the result of this. The aim to establish a nation state in the ethnic or even racial sense has thus been a key recipe for war, not only to emancipate nations from empires and foreign domination, but also for an internal purge of those whom these aspiring nations saw as not belonging to them. Let me add three observations here. One is that no state in Europe today contains only and exclusively people who speak one language. Ethically speaking, no nation in Europe is homogeneous and no nation is in the ethnic sense a nation state. It is true that the multiple genocide and persecutions of minorities committed during and immediately after the Second World War left Europe with ethnically more homogeneous states than it probably had ever known. But even then, ethnic minorities continued to exist in the states of Europe. Since the 1960s, new waves of immigration in the context of decolonization and of bringing in guest workers have made Europe very much more multi-ethnic again. According to Eurostat, almost a tenth of the population of the current EU, including the UK, um, is foreign-born, with the highest percentages of 12% and above in Austria, Sweden, Spain, Belgium and Germany. This figure, incidentally, does not include the linguistic minorities who survived the Second World War in situ. Roughly two out of three of these new um, immigrants into uh, Europe were not born in another EU state. Immigration has come mainly from beyond Europe, from Turkey and from former colonies. It is worth pondering that in 1933, when the Germans embarked upon their anti-Semitic madness, less than 1% of the population was Jewish, yet anti-Semitism was a mass sentiment that could be ignited in the population. Today, 3.4% of the population of Germany are Turkish citizens or of Turkish or Kurdish extraction, and 12% of the people living in France are estimated to be Muslim. Almost all Muslims are first or second generation immigrants to Europe, as Islam has not been an indigenous religion except in previously Ottoman occupied areas of southeastern Europe. Now, add to this my second observation. Ethnic, and thus by definition discriminatory, xenophobic nationalism is not dead, as any of, many of us had hoped that it would be when we were building the EU. Unfortunately, it is experiencing a revival. It underlies Poland's, Hungary's, the Czech Republic's refusal to admit refugees. We see it in the rise of the nationalist parties in Austria, in Germany, in Britain, where Brexit seems to be all about stopping immigration. In France, where last year, of course, in the presidential elections, we saw a candidate from the National Front opposing the present uh, president. We see it in Italy, in Sweden. Mix this now with the existing distribution of ethnic and religious minorities in Europe, then security in Europe could be upset from within, and the poisonous mix would concern most old Europe EU countries. So within meaning, of course, that it has implications for security that are not interstate, but intrastate. You shouldn't be looking at the relations between states to analyze this, but what's happening within states and across state boundaries. My third observation is that discrimination is not necessarily exclusively one-sided. The many waves of Christian migration across Europe, Poles to mining areas in the 19th century, Spaniards fleeing fascism in the 1930s, Italians in search of work in the 1950s and 60s, and the German and French Jews were usually assimilated within a generation. By contrast, we are seeing varying degrees of assimilation of the new immigrant minorities today. Some assimilate very quickly, others prefer not to, apparently for cultural and religious reasons. 
as in the centuries or even millennia before the invention of the ethnic nation-state ideal, before centralized governments tried to impose single languages and universal primary education on all citizens, we now again live in a world in which minorities can, if they wish to, live in a parallel society, in a bubble, connected with virtual umbilical cords to their country and culture that they hailed from, with TV stations and newspapers in their own language, their own religious centre, a butcher, a grocery shop and even a bank, a removal company, a canteen and at times with their own jurisdiction. This is true not only for the large Turkish community, say, in Berlin, but also for the large Portuguese community in London, among whom I lived in the 1990s. They had their own social centre, their own care home for the elderly, their own church, their own Saturday school, their own grocer, and their own fishmonger. And the fishmonger, incidentally, had great difficulties communicating in English. Such non-assimilation had existed previously, but actually mainly in Eastern Europe, and only rarely in Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, the, the German speakers who were invited by Empress Catherine the Great of Russia to come and settle along the Volga imported newspapers and products from their homeland until the Russian Revolution and also lived in a cultural bubble, which is why Stalin so mistrusted them that in the Second World War he deported them all to Siberia. In similar ways, for centuries, diaspora communities of Jews, Armenians, Greeks, Genoese and Venetians all over Eastern Europe and around the Mediterranean entertained close and regular contact with sister communities and generally kept apart from the majority societies in which they lived, rarely intermarrying with locals, instead accepting arranged marriages. In Western Europe, by contrast, there tended to be much more intermarriage, more integration into the political, artistic and academic, as well as economic elites, in short, assimilation. Today, cheap air travel is making such continuing connections with a country of origin possible for ever more people. It seems quite common among British citizens of Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin, for example, to get married to bribes from Pakistan and Bangladesh. Meanwhile, annually, over 5,000 little girls from Britain are flown to African co countries, mainly East African countries, so that somebody there can mutilate their genitals. But the purpose is, of course, to keep them apart from the rest of the population of the UK and make them fit to marry people from their own culture. Such rejection of the third degree of assimilation, the third degree, the first degree being to trade with, the second degree being to, uh, to celebrate with the convivium, and the third being the connubium, to intermarry, is not necessarily dangerous or pernicious. Nor is intermarriage a complete safeguard against persecution, as Nazi Germany and Bosnia illustrated. But if you mix in the return of nationalism and racism, the rejection of assimilation by a minority is unlikely to help. We see the first straws in the wind of such build-up of hostility on both sides within our society, with the so far numerically tiny manifestations of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism in the Western world. But the longer-term effects could be one in which Western societies are split within themselves, not only on political lines in a way that are healthy for a democracy, but in irreconcilable religious ways. The analogies with the European confessional wars of the 16th to the 17th century, and indeed the Cold War, are striking. We see fear of an enemy's fifth column within one's own society. We see visceral hatred and distrust propaganda warfare and fanaticism on both sides. This could well be one form of violent conflict of the future. It is perhaps not the only threat to Europe's security, thanks to Putin, but one to be taken very seriously. And let me underscore that this threat arises from intra-societal relations, not from interstate or intergovernmental, in the classical sense, international relations. Let us return <coughs> to the origins of the discipline of IR. It was born out of war. The horrors of the First World War planted in many minds the idea that ways must be found to avoid another war such as this through the study of what had begun to be called international relations, international politics and international affairs. You all know the pedigree of international relations with the first chair being created in Aberystwyth, then the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and uh, the Council of Foreign Relations, all created in the 1920s. Um, we, there was also an Institute of External Affairs in Hamburg and the Institut Universitaire des Instituts Internationales in Geneva. 
all had in common that their foundation was driven by the desire to find alternatives to war for the settlement of disputes between states. And this would also be true for the uh, later foundations after the Second World War, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Department of War Studies, and various other institutions. All these, um, but the, the creations of the 1920s and the 1930s, unfortunately did not prevent a Hitler from seizing control of the mass movement and then setting the world on fire. Nevertheless, my first contention is that the studies we pursue should continue to focus on efforts on preventing, containing, limiting, or at least humanizing war. To much of what crosses my desk these days with the label IR, this can barely be related, even with much imagination, especially when it is drowned by jargon and modeling and obscure references to the huge industry of publications based on a questionable methodology to which I shall return later. While all the efforts made in the 1920s did not prevent the Second World War, it is difficult to prove, but possible, that in the long term, and they and all that was uh, subsequently done after the Second World War have so far helped to prevent a Third World War. I urge you to continue seeing this, the study of war, the study of its origins, of how to replace it by peaceful ways of settling conflicts, how to constrain it and how to end it once it is broken out, as the continuing main purpose of our common discipline. To come to my second point, unlike international relations, of course, war studies can hardly be accused of not having its heart in the right place, the focus on war. And yet there are areas which tend to be neglected in war studies, and I think I've already built up the case for one of them. As an area of research, it too is arguably excessively focused on interstate war, thereby sidelining premeditated collective violence used by one large group against another within states, sometimes within several states with transboundary or transnational connections to both sides. To repeat, this was of course the pattern of the European confessional wars of the 16th and 17th centuries. There have been long scholarly debates about whether the Holocaust would have been possible if it had not happened in the context of a major war. Indeed, if it had been thinkable, let alone executable, if it had not been within a context where normal laws had been suspended. Be that as it may, other examples of genocide have sadly occurred since, outside a formal declared war. What is more important than the correlation with the formal state of external war, to my mind, is the subjective definition by the perpetrators of such genocide as a war against a terribly dangerous enemy group, however unarmed they were in reality. This was the case in Hitler's Germany, in Pol Pot's Kampuchea and Rwanda. To repeat, the people who did it pretended to themselves and to others that they were engaged in the war because that other group was so terribly dangerous, even if they were in reality unarmed civilians. Thus, even when such killing is one-sided and not reciprocal, given the numbers of fatalities affected, premeditated collective violence used by one large group against another should, in my view, be included in our study of war. War has, in my view, been too long defined and considered in terms of two armed groups of humans fighting with each other. From the perspective of international law, it was long defined more narrowly as the more violent, organized conflict between sovereign states. Civil wars and insurgencies, as a form of civil war, have been particularly distasteful to states as they challenge the general assumption that states are the only legitimate actors in international relations and that a challenge to one state or its government from within implies a challenge to the legitimacy of all states, which no state government likes to see questioned. Civil war thus featured rarely in the writings on strategy or war in the 19th century, and most writing about insurgency concerned how to quell it. Martin van Creveld was the first after the end of the Second World, of, after the uh, end of the Cold War, to argue that on the one hand, sub-state war was now was not a new form but an old form of war, mainly but not exclusively a form of war predating the modern state. On the other hand, he argued. The model of intrastate violence is likely to be more common in wars in the near future than interstate wars. Yet, war studies and strategic studies rarely focus on civil wars. 
At least there is a copious literature on past insurgencies, counterinsurgency operations and colonial warfare, usually written by military historians or strategic analysts from the point of view of the colonial power or the counterinsurgents, but still. Neither civil wars nor insurgencies were part of the jus at bellum or jus in bello in the classical sense. Since antiquity, rebels have generally been treated with infinitely greater harshness than adversaries seen as legitimate. Even though civil wars and insurgencies are covered also by what is now known as the law of armed conflict, the UN Security Council has repeatedly hesitated for a long time or failed to agree on the need for intervention when genocide or other forms of minority persecutions take place. Thus it was when we witnessed the ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia in the 1990s, when the Hutus engaged in the mass killing of the Tutsis in Rwanda in 1994, and when the Arabs started raping and killing non-Arab populations in Darfur in 2003, or when ISIL chased the Yazidis out of their homeland. Even though the UN's Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of 1948 engages the contracting parties to act to prevent and punish any occurrence of the large-scale persecutions and massacres of unarmed civilians, the tendencies for states today is still to shirk from intervening in the, eternal, in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. The killings of the members of the Kurdish minority in Iraq by Saddam Hussein's regime was only stopped when the UN in November 1990 authorised military action against Saddam because he had at a later point invaded the sovereign state of Kuwait. Several EU European Union states felt that they could only legitimately help the former Yugoslav republics of Croatia and Bosnia defend themselves against Serbia or rump Yugoslavia if they recognised them as sovereign states first. Other examples could be listed, but the crucial point is that genocide or any other form of mass killing of unarmed civilians is still not treated like interstate war and is still rarely adopted as a case for UN authorised intervention. The responsibility to protect, about which so much has been written by scholars, is rarely honoured in the act by the UN's pentarchy. And I can see that Western intervention in recent years have not turned out very well. But in the large part, uh, this is to be blamed on the pentarchy itself, as a structure expecting selfish great powers with divergent self-interests to agree before anything can be done successfully. I shall leave you to debate whether, for example, President Obama uh, would have done something about the Bashar al-Assad regime's crossing of his red line by using chemical weapons if he had not feared the reaction of Russia. There is a similar hesitation to include the mass killing of non-combatants in the academic study of war. German official military historians, for example, long refused to study the killing of Jews and other minorities despised by the National Socialists as they claimed that this had been done by the SS and not by the Wehrmacht. Bravely against great opposition, one of my predecessors in Potsdam at the Military History Research Institute, Manfred Messerschmidt, in the 1970s, succeeded to get his institute to write, to begin writing an official history of the Second World War, but it took three decades until a, a couple of volumes were published that tackled the social dimension of the German Reich, including the Holocaust and the use of enemy civilians and the, the use of forced labour. It took an equally brave exhibition in 2001 by an entirely non-governmental sponsored research institute, the Hamburg Institute for Social Research under Philipp Rimsma, to force Germans to face up to the substantial involvement of the Wehrmacht in the final solution. It was not just the SS. Nor do the hesitations to link mass slaughter of non-combatants to war stop there. Prominent genocide researchers such as Irving Louis Horowitz and Kurt Jonasson deny such a link. Departments of War Studies or Strategic Studies rarely include genocide experts. Literature on war rarely includes genocide. Literature on genocide rarely focuses primarily on the nexus of war. There are notable exceptions, including the periodical War Crimes, Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity. But even they treat the nexus as a primarily 20th century phenomenon. At best, the concession is made that this form of intrastate killing occurs in supposedly new wars, belied by even a cursory knowledge of European history. They're not new. If we are concerned to reduce mass casualties, then the mass killing of unarmed people of all ages and sexes would be seen, must be seen, should be included in our study of war. My second contention is that we should integrate mass persecutions and war within states into our own paradigm of war, if we want to understand war. Moreover, 
the prominence of massacres in human history provides a key to understanding why the development of laws and conventions for the protection of non-combatants has been offset by glaring examples of willfully ignoring these and by mass killings of defenseless humans perpetrated even by democra democratic states who argued that they were acting in conformity with the laws of war. Finally, if the paradigm of war is adjusted to include the mass killing of non-combatants and to put more emphasis on civil wars and insurgencies, we have to take leave of the notion that the state is the entity best suited for our study or best suited to protect its citizens from war as states and proto-state entities have perpetrated the mass killing of unarmed groups of people and most effectively so. If organised by states, such mass killings were planned, carefully prepared and executed on scales of two or more decimal points, points larger than any spontaneous or non-state planned massacres. This is far from being the first time that this argument about the state's questionable role as guarantor of security has been made. But this claim about its role as such is still at the heart of all defences of state sovereignty against further European integration or against equipping the UN with a police force ready and able to intervene immediately with a standing army as soon as there is proof of massacres of genocide being prepared or taking place. Switching to a completely different level, I will now air my, in my last point my uh, gripes about issues of methodology in studying all this. This, in general, concerns IR scholars more than people who see themselves doing war studies. But gradually, it is seeping into every area of uh, studies of uh, political sciences and, 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 I imagine, also the arts and humanities. It concerns the methodological tyranny that is spreading through acceptance criteria imposed by academic journals, research councils and student training modules by universities. Everywhere around me, I see the same reductionist approach. It begins with a theory, such as widespread economic hardship led leads to war. Blocks 2020, in brackets. Usually, Blocks 2020 has established this on the basis of three examples. The researcher, the student, is now expected to find three further examples to falsify the theory and to come up with its refinement, rejection or replacement. This might be, economic hardship leads to war if the government is bellicose. But what about a host of other factors, say I? Democracy, long established democracy, size of the country, the population, the economy, type of economy, culture and historical experience of that polity, geographic position, particularities and values of the leaders of that policy, and so on all of which will play their part in making this initial theory true or false for any individual country, as any good historian would tell you. The range of factors is far too large to be able to say anything other than that there is a pattern of correlation that sometimes holds, but may well be overruled by other factors. And how can one in the real world keep all the other factors constant, as the exercise says you have to do? These other factors may be of greatly superior importance. How can one define them out of the picture when doing a study based on real cases? It makes no sense to compare, say, Germany and France in the 1930s when defining out of the picture the Versailles settlement or the person of Hitler or the short experience with democracy in Germany. Contrary to the prevailing journal and research council approved methodology, I contend that our research can best identify recurrent patterns, but not predict what strengths they will have in their interplay with many other factors, each mix being unique. Therefore, in each case, the mix of factors, the mix of patterns colliding or overlaying one another must be examined, not merely one. Moreover, would the result of the application of the monocausal methodology described above be even remotely useful to policymakers? How would that help us today, for example, to gauge the intentions of Vladimir Putin or those around him? How the potential receptivity of the Russian population to a policy steering Russia not only onto a path of confrontation with the West, but actually towards war? What can we do to prevent this? Where will the next African civil war erupt? What can end the war in Syria? How can one best influence Bashar al-Assad, Tayyip Erdogan, Viktor Orban or even Benjamin Netanyahu for that matter. <laughs>
Against the background of austerity, unemployment, depletion of state treasuries, how can we steer politics away from the rival revival of nationalism? How hedge against violent expressions of xenophobia? How prevent communities living in parallel societies within our countries becoming scapegoats and persecuted minorities? If the theory and its test and its methodology and its results bear no relationship to the real worries and questions of policymakers, nor to the complexities of realities, how is this methodology anything but an in intellectual pastime, a game, l'art pour l'art, a Luftgeschäft, unproductive intellectual work? Not only is there no point in it, it is also scandalous that it should be imposed increasingly as the only acceptable methodology by leading journals in the discipline, by research councils, and by the ministries of education which back the research councils. I'm coming to my conclusion. Coffee is nigh. To sum up, I've tried to make the following points. Our priority in our larger discipline of international relations, as well as more lo logically and more obviously in war studies, should continue to be, as our founding fathers suggested, to find just ways of to avoid and at least to limit war. And war should be defined loosely to include the premeditated collective exercise of violence of one group against another and of violence within the state. This must mean perpetual openness to what other disciplines can tell us about the causes of war and premeditated collective violence, which includes disciplines like zoology, group psychology, sociology, and many more. To stretch our imagination, it is helpful to cast off assumptions that are too narrowly and exclusively founded in 19th century political thinking. Neither has the world always consisted of neatly bounded territorial states, with ethnically and religiously homogeneous populations, nor will this model continue best to describe future polities. In fact, it may blinker us to understanding what is going on in our societies. The modern state is not the be-all and end-all of social development, as Hegel and Fichte thought, and Western democracies are not the end of history. It would be helpful if scholars stopped using the term the nation-state when they talk about Europe, and probably also when referring to African and Asian countries, unless they mean republics on the other, one hand, or nations that are trying to bring all their co-nationals within the fold, like Hitler's Germany. The terms international and transnational only lend themselves to confusion. While nothing should stop us from imagining and designing new ways of settling conflict, new organizations, new structures and processes, it is illogical and methodologically unsound to build these on false claims about reality. In this context, it would be helpful if scholars stopped conjuring up the fake news of a Westphalian system or of Westphalian order of Europe, as that never existed, and stopped confusing real politic with soi-disant realism. Finally, we should not let the modelling and theorising become a happy game in itself, a Luftgeschäft, a la polar. Perhaps a plausible case can be made for this, but if so, I have yet to hear it. And at the moment, all I can see it is extremely dangerous because if you're trying to have uh, theories flowing from uh, th uh, three examples, reducing them in this monocausal way to one solution, leaving out all the other things, just imagine people like that then going out up to governments and saying, because I have seen three insurgencies where this worked, now apply this to insurgency N plus one, to insurgency number four, without taking into consideration all the other cases. To end where I began, being the incumbent of a new chair of international relations myself, probably the youngest in the British Isles, I have not, I must admit, attempted so far to have its name changed. Nor is inter-polity relations, let alone inter-entity relations, more likely to catch on. And as I have, of course, just made a big plug for including intra-policy conflict and mass violence transcending borders, which both pits populations within one state against one another and connects them with populations in others, equally in conflict with one another. I have just made the case for including those as well in the studies, so changing the name just to inter-entity inter relations wouldn't do enough. Donald Watt came to the conclusion that when it comes to defining the larger field of our studies, we might of course say what the Beatles replied when on a visit to the United States. They were asked, say, what do you call your hairstyle? Upon which they answered, we call it Lucy. Alternatively, we are stuck with international relations, I suppose. 
it is still up to us to give this term the focus and the meaning which makes its study worthwhile. Thank you for your attention.